a little bit about us. This is Lena uh, Irene Andersen. Uh, I am Karianne Rønning Ellekrans and we are the founders of Laid and what we do is uh, design, develop and sell and manufacture sex toys under our brand Laid, which is there. We are, you know, working with this topic on a very professional level, uh, which sometimes creates uh, conflict and also <coughs> Uh, in the sense that, and we'll get to it, uh, why it is extra challenging sometimes to work with what we do. Uh, but we forgot drawing. But, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm <laughs> just, 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 so we're going to talk a little bit about things, and that rather than present the presentation ahead of time, we'll just go along, so we'll surprise you instead. Uh, but to begin with, just to get everyone in the right frame of mind, uh, everybody has received a piece of paper. And it says one, two, three, four. So we're going to do a little drawing exercise. Uh, you can label it, you can put your name on it, or remain anonymous. We are going to collect these, so it's up to you. Uh, and we will come back to them later in the pre presentation. Uh, yeah, okay, number one. Draw, as you feel free to do, uh, a penis and testicles. <laughs> 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 you can do it the fun, easy way or very anatomically correct, up to you. Now, a, a vagina. Okay, number three, the prostate. And number four, draw the clitoris. So this, this drawing exercise comes down to the very core of what we have to work with uh, when it, we design our products. Uh, at the center of uh, human sexuality and sex are our sexual organs. Now we could have asked you to draw the brain as well as the fifth, but regarding the products we design and develop, we have to have a lot of knowledge about the human anatomy and the sexual anatomy and all the, a lot of it is hidden. So most likely, most of you have drawn something very incorrect, at least on one of them, maybe on more. Uh, uh, and, the, and the point is that, uh, you know, to even begin to understand it, we have to know a little bit what it looks like and how it works. So, and it's also so we get over the, you know, to get over these things before we start talking about them there, it's nice to have it out in the open and laugh a little bit about it and shake loose. And, Maybe it's a little bit embarrassing, maybe it's a little bit fun, but it's, uh, it's all a part of who we are and, and can, uh, be, will be central. And hopefully you'll all see some wonderful images of what you've just drawn, uh, but our versions of them. So going back to what we started with uh, is the whole idea of sex toys, sex toys for having sex or enjoying sex more or masturbation. Overall, historically, you know, uh, this is the image the last 20, 30 years people have had of the sex toy store. It's not inviting, it's actually already like shameful going in there. Uh, and this is yeah, and also inside, I mean, this is like the products you imagine that you can buy It's there. a standard impression, that's what we all have in our in our minds when we think about sex toys, sex toy <coughs> stores. Of course, the last few years, this has really changed. And for us, when we started out, when Lena did her industrial design uh, master uh, diploma, which mm. is what led to this, uh, our challenge was how do we overcome those previous images and making it more accessible, both for a shop to sell, but also for you to buy. 
because there's a lot of shame involved here, and we want that out of the picture. Uh, so from the previous store to this store, and this is the kind of store that sells our product. And this is what our product looks like. So it's the contrast. It's from getting from what you saw earlier to that. <coughs> and it's every detail has to be thought about. And every part of the function, the impression, getting over yourself, uh, your own limitations. You just have to walk it, walk through it all. And, and then finally, you end up with something simple and accessible uh, that also works. And also we go to exhibitions, and I mean, this is some images we had from our first year. <laughs> this was our shock treatment. <laughs> uh, to see what, it's fun. And it's, can, can be way out images? there. Can you see the images? Is it too light? Or? No. Yeah. But basically, it's, this is a classic image, and this exists. 70, 89% of the world's sex toy industry, and is more related to that. And that's, again, what we, in a way, have to, we have to embrace it and then separate. And we take, <coughs> take the good stuff and go further with it. So this is the contrast between us and an exhibition and what you saw before. Squeaky clean. <laughs> <laughs> but the true challenge uh, with what we do is that it involves money. We make products, anyone who makes a product sells it. We happen to make products that are meant to, use, to be used with, in a sexual act. And money and sex has never been a very positive association. <coughs> and we, through trying to get uh, raising money uh, or uh, even talking about what we do, uh, the associations other people get it goes very quickly. We've been faced with anything from, that makes me think of AIDS, to uh, trafficking. And that we are put into the same uh, little uh, group <laughs> as that. That we're advocating something shameful, uh, harmful, uh, and, and that has nothing to do with it. So the challenge for us is not only what we do and what the products we do to make it accessible for you, but it's also to hopefully teach people to separate that everything to do with sex. Sex between two people, we all think is beautiful. Uh, and this is a part of that act. It's a part of your own sexuality, whether you have sex with yourself or with someone else. Nothing more, nothing less. It's just, it's a toy, you know, it's, mm. it's harmless. So, <laughs> you've had a little moment. And uh, now we're going back to your drawings. And what you see here is the vagina. I see some faces. <laughs> <laughs> now, the <coughs> vagina is expandable. So this is somebody, an artist, who has actually modeled or taken, uh, made a cast. Uh, and of course, in filling the vagina, then it will fill out differently than when it's in its uh, <laughs> tight form. <laughs> so the idea is, if you've drawn on your drawing of a vagina, if you wouldn't have drawn that. But you should have drawn something which is more like just a canal going in. That's the vagina. How many drew something on the outside? <laughs> <laughs> That's the vulva. <laughs> vulva are all the exterior sexual parts to a woman. The vagina is just that, you know, the entrance, from the entrance to uh, where the uterus begins. That's the vagina. We've skipped ahead mm -hmm. to the, yeah, you can see. This is the vagina. And the yellow one, or the Guess what one? the yellow one is? Clitoris? That's the clitoris. That's an erect clitoris. It's the first sonogram made of, of this by some French doctors. And what you see here is, this is, most of this you won't see. I mean, we all know the little button or <laughs> similar that might be on, 
might be visible on the outside, but most of it is on the inside and behind. And it's, as you can see, it actually stretches in and around the vagina, which means for stimulation in, within the vagina, you are touching the clitoris from the inside. So, and how many do something like that? <laughs> Great. So, but, but do you, did people draw just the... Most people just draw a spot. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was, yeah, two people that draw something like that, or three. three people. Yeah. So, and so for us, we would say that, you know, and I can ask you know, your opinion on this, and, uh, uh, but that drawing exercise you did now, would you think it's too much to ask uh, students in school to, to do that? No. Would it be an okay way to actually teach them a little bit about their bodies without going into the touchy-feely part of it? Because basically we don't know, we never learned this. We do not learn this at all. Uh, and especially because it will, <laughs> for women, but also <coughs> with men, the prostate, which is maybe next. No, oh, it's first the penis. <laughs> first the penis. <laughs> so any one of those would be correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually the simplest one. The, uh, and then how many got that right? Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a man's world, still, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, the prostate. Uh, as you know, it's inside the body. Uh, so this one was a bit tricky because if you just drew like a little walnut or something, in a way that would be correct. Uh, if you've also drawn it in placing it according to the rest of the anatomy, then that's even more correct. Uh, and as a sexual organ, I'm not good, well, are you familiar <laughs> with that it feels good to stimulate the prostate? Yes, no. Have you ever touched a prostate? No. But you can, you can give you an impression of it. So if everybody takes their tongue and sticks it out in between their molars, their teeth, the side of your cheek, up rib, <laughs> and you touch the tip of your tongue, it's like a little bump and some soft tissue. Well, something like that is what it's going to feel like if you ever decide to explore it. But this is like the man's clitoris. It is uh, super sensitive. It might take some work, but it really, really does uh, the trick, <laughs> if you will. But more importantly, and something that actually using sex toys leads to, people are much more comfortable with their bodies, which <coughs> means if something starts going wrong, if your prostate hardens or something, which is a sign of something not being right, then you actually go and check it out. Prostate cancer is, and also testicular cancer, are issues for a lot of men because they simply don't get familiar with their bodies. We have a, a product, a penis ring called P2, which goes around the penis and the balls and stimulates the prostate from the outside, what you call perineum. Yeah. Yes, which mm -hmm. would be right under here. Skrocken mellom kjøtte. As, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's not so nice. Uh, and, we, and speaking of our products, we have them out and we thought after the presentation it's possible to go and have a look at them and we can also be around and we can tell you a little bit more about how they function rather than do that up here. But all of our products are designed to function with the complete organ, not just the visual side of it. We have to be able to work internally as well. Uh, and this is more showing our process. Uh, yeah, because we are from the start to the beginning, like the, the whole manufacturing part, and we broke very close with the factory in China, and so we're hands on the whole way. Every step of the way, every mm -hmm. detail we're involved in, and then we work with very good, talented people in their areas to, to make, you know, use specialists for the specialist parts, and then we're in the center of it all. So this is just a little impression of, of the manufacturing side. Uh, and as you can see, it's like any other product. Mm -hmm. The products we make, we cannot, like I said, we have to get over ourselves, put sex aside, and then you go ahead and you treat it like any other product, and you make the best product you possibly can. Uh, and, then, and then you're back to 
facing people and, uh, and most people when they see our products relax. It's not too intimidating, I think. Uh, and, uh, and also a big part of our, our, I mean, it's the whole branding around our brand, with taking care of the packaging, the user manual, especially the user manuals, because we export to four different countries and having a user manual in four different languages would be. So we have a lot of good illustrations and how to put a penis ring on and how to use it and we don't have to like explain it but. As you can see we've stripped away a lot. We, mm. We've taken away a lot because we're dealing with the kind of product we are. And when dealing with sex we don't have to over sexify it. What's important for us is to leave only what is necessary behind. So by stripping down the brand uh, to something that's very clear, I mean, we're called laid, you're getting laid. That's a clear message. We call the products exactly what they are. It is a cock ring, it is a dildo, it is a clitoral vibrator. We use words, we don't hide. But by using this kind of branding, we are allowed to be direct. And that's important that people actually do get the information they need about the product. Yes? including our own font. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now you know all well, what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> we, uh, we have, uh, first of all, if Thea, uh, if, did you see anyone who? Yes. <laughs> Are, are there names on them? Um, two of them just get plus for their drawings. <laughs> <laughs> are they all anonymous? Yeah. Okay, but if... Um, I think everyone is anonymous in this competition. Yeah. <laughs> well, basically, these three could have gotten a product. <laughs> if you want to own up to them, it's hard because to see. I'm sure people will be honest. So you, if you pass these yeah, three yes. around, yeah, yeah then yeah, then you just <coughs> keep keep that and come up to us after, and then you, know, you get something. Okay. But also, everyone who's been here until the uh, we have our business cards here and everything. So everybody here until the 30th of June can buy any lay product at a 25% discount from, directly from us, so we can be very discreet about it. Uh, and that's the pricing there, and we can also send that information. All you do is say that you were here, uh, and that's enough, and then we can arrange it. So that's the extra gift, if you will, if you make use of it, of course. Uh, so we've uh, kept it short. Uh, and then we thought we could open up for some, I don't know if you have any questions or uh, if you, yeah? Which four countries do you export to? Forty. 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 Yeah. What's the biggest market? US. The biggest market is the US. It is, I think, for any, it's the biggest consumer market for on all levels, I, I guess, and also for a product such as ours. Uh, it's, uh, even if you have a tiny, tiny bit there, you know, it's, Norway's what total of five million, and the market for sex toys is much much bigger there. Uh, so that's where the biggest effort needs to be made. But it's also because they have the most professional consumers too. You can actually they they uh, they're very demanding. They know their rights. They, that's the and that means almost half of a product like ours actually is bought in a store, not online, in a country like that, because they actually go out to check out the product before they place a hundred dollars uh, on it. Uh, so, and that really works well for high-end uh, products. Yeah. Were you thinking of expanding like the product categories, like go to clothes, I don't know, perfume, or something else? It, there's a choice to be made. Uh, we we have our fantastic T-shirts <laughs> that we use to promote ourselves, and we know we probably could sell them. Bed linen. We there's a lot we can play on. Uh, is it merchandising or is it something that we're going to actually sell? Uh, if you want to build a bigger brand, then you need to branch out into other product categories. And, and if we want to get into mainstream shops, it's going to take still some time before 
our products make it there. So we might actually have to have other products to, to get the brand out into the mainstream. So it's under consideration, but with that you need a lot more resources. Yeah? Um, what do you make of, for instance, I've seen Durex in even grocery stores in Norway, they sell like small sexual aids yeah. as part of like a package with condoms. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, Durex has the reach and the distribution and uh, most stores don't think about the fact that they're selling a sex toy with the condom. So it's a condom with an added extra. And that makes it accessible. And it's funny enough that, uh, that they're sold in all, all stores. I mean, uh, whether it's a grocery store or Nardivison kiosks, you can get them everywhere. And, and that is fine. Uh, but once we come and say, would you like to sell? I mean, we don't necessarily want to be put in and AM on places like that with our products, but uh, I think it's great because it, it's like a teaser. It might be the first introduction for some, and then maybe, hopefully, they want to try some good products because there's two sides to it. They're used once, throw away. There's a lot of, with the condom, that's fine, but with the toy, that's kind of waste. So if you invest in a, in a, in a, in a product, that you can use for a lifetime, then that's the better choice, also for the environment. But yeah. um, uh, also uh, our product categories, I mean, we have the Kegel balls, it's more exercise. I mean, we're trying to reach it out to like, um, Farmers, oh no, uh, uh, gyms. Gyms, um, those kind of places. And we also have the D1, which is the Norwegian National Rock, and make, sell it as a souvenir. So it's also how we can place our existing products in different kind of platforms as well. Yes? What got you initially interested in starting a business in this industry? Well, it started with, uh, the history goes back to Lena. She graduated from the architecture, School of Architecture and Design in Oslo, uh, Aho. And for her master's degree, she decided to design a sex toy set for couples to work within a field that hadn't really been worked in and to create something, you know, working with her hands uh, rather than maybe designing more classic uh, industrial design products. That's how it began and we knew each other at the time so I helped a little bit with the research and it became a very big process and suddenly you realize that you, you probably have more information than a lot of people making products already. So the idea of the design she came up with and that they really work well, it begin, it's, it's like we can't just let this be become a concept. So we decided to, let's see if we can make a business out of it. And that well, was in 2007, yeah. <laughs> so it takes time, uh, but that was the beginning. And then it's ended up being a fantastic journey in uh, both learning how to develop a business, but also getting to know this industry and the side of it that we're involved in. Because all over the world, there's a fantastic group of people who all have different backgrounds, who have ended up working with sex toys for many different reasons uh, and creating this little, little tiny niche still uh, of great products and hopefully that, that's going to become the norm and not that hidden away store and, 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 and the shame around it. Yeah. So that's why we want to continue. It's, it's very positive. <laughs> well, maybe we're, we're too small to get that statistic, but if you think generally, even about when people have sex uh, more, it's when in bad financial times, people <laughs> tend to, it, it happens something with the psyche of people. Uh, you, your need for closeness increases. There's more intimacy. Uh, when, uh, especially in the States, when uh, they had the worst of it, uh, the sex toy sales uh, rose by, you know, 20, 30 percent. And that's because people choose, one, not to go out and spend money on unnecessary things, but then will still invest in a good toy. But the other thing is, in fact, and also after 9-11, the, the sex rate went sky high, and that's because people need to be closer to other people. Uh, but also in Norway, in the north of Norway, <laughs> in the north, <laughs> you have that whole half a year of uh, darkness. People are inside, and what to do? <laughs> so there, there is correlation between uh, 
bigger uh, things uh, and uh, that people actually find uh, themselves in the bedroom together. Uh, but I think the influence of, you know, nobody's quite cracked that code when it comes to if you put, how do you put it into your design or how you communicate a brand. Uh, that's tough. It's more, it's very b decided by the people. Like with the Fifty Shades of Grey, suddenly a hundred million, mostly women, uh, have, you know, purchased the books, uh, downloaded them, and are interested in trying <laughs> a whip for the first time. And it's acceptable suddenly. It's just this paradigmal shift, and, and, and then it's fine. And something that is so taboo. Um, and you can't predict it. It's whenever people are ready, it, it suddenly happens. Yes. Uh, yeah. We <laughs> we have uh, a few shops. This one. You see what happened to this one. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't go so well. Uh, <laughs> we have a couple of stores. There are a lot of online stores, and they don't buy directly from us even. So there are more stores in Norway than we know of that sell our products. But yes, we have it in Kundumeria, so it is available nationwide uh, to go into a store. And also here in Oslo, there's a shop called Flirt. Uh, that, that carries the products and there's a couple of others too but uh, it's a tough business retail is a tough business it's not just about being a sex toy store but it's very tough for retail businesses so a lot of them close the, the brick and mortar shops are struggling uh, so but they are available and on our web page you can see a list of all the places they are available in uh, in Norway under where to get laid yeah One, two, and uh, currently three. Uh, yeah, uh, we. Um, Tia is the intern at, m yeah. at the moment. At the moment, it's a permanent. <laughs> permanent <laughs> Don't want to lose her. Uh, we, we, like I said initially, we, uh, we're we're not big enough to have like full on hire people at this stage. But so you buy the services instead, because so, of course we can't do everything ourselves. Uh, but yeah. I was going to ask about what part of the uh, production line do you do yourself and what not? I mean, I guess you do uh, the product design yourself, but then in terms of production, how much knowledge do you know of what materials to use and where to source them and who makes them? We basically, when we develop a product, then we, we make the product specification, which is exactly that is what it needs to be. And so when it comes to what materials, we can make several models and prototypes on our own to figure out if the shape works, what material will be good. But then it's very good when you're working with a factory to let them handle the prototyping because then they're accountable. The more we do ourselves and hand it over, the more mistakes, if they're made, then who's they blame, blame. It on us. It's like you so yeah. it's very important to, to actually do not do too much yourself work with whoever's going to actually manufacture it, gives them ownership and accountability, and you get a better pro product. But I make the um, um, shapes or the products in the foam first, and then I make it in stone, and we test it out without vibration or anything like that. And if it works without vibration, of course it's going to work with vibration as well. And we're not a high-tech... No, we're not. We're, I mean, we're, there's, we're more low-tech. <laughs> where we're trying to solve as much of the functionality through form. So we can do a lot of that on our own and test it with a mm. little group of people. Uh, and then uh, when it comes to the production, we are on site, we visit, we have, we have people, we have somebody who works for us in China uh, who can also do the uh, quality checking all the way through. And I also used to live in China for two years, so it's like, yeah, I know a little bit of the production, yeah, being there. And yeah. And mm. So I go there twice a year to follow up the production. And then we do the certification and have mm -hmm. external agencies like SGS and stuff test the products, make sure everything is, it, it's, it's fairly safe, but you do that anyway to be on the safe side and also to have the C and all the quality marks that you need to have, you have to have the test done. So we have to do like, it's like a triple control process to be on the safe side. Sure, it's all good. Is there a threat that they're going to copy? There might be. Uh, the one thing with our products is they're quite complex uh, because they are, they are a little bit odd in their... They're not the <laughs> optimal products for production. Uh, 
uh, because they're very asymmetrical. Uh, so if somebody's going to copy, they'll have to find a very cheap material. They don't work so good in other materials, so, and they're not vibrators, most of them. So, but the copies come, and there's more a visual copy uh, of the bigger brands, and, uh, and there are true copies too. Um, there's a choice if you want to pursue that but, or not. Of if course they're only sold on the market in China, that maybe that's not the biggest threat. We have trademarked uh, our products. We've actually also protected them in China so that we can if we need to, but um, I, I think it's a compliment if you're copied uh, <laughs> and it would take a lot to be a, become a real threat. Uh, and I think a lot of people waste terrible amounts of money pursuing, uh, pursuing it if it isn't really, because the stores who sell our products wouldn't sell a copy. So it's and they will see <coughs> it's a copy as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and also the packaging and everything, they will see it's a copy. And they actually tell us, is this uh, your product? Did you actually make this one? Yeah, with a D one. So. Mm. Mm. Yes. But if you take just one product, can you tell us like approximate numbers? How many of them you sell like through the year, for instance? Well, they're all manual. I, mean, I think w what we've been for for now, we've been more establishing ourselves. And one of the challenges we've had is that we almost, you know, we had to stop because uh, we ran out of money. So the sales, and also that we've established a brand using niche products in a niche market. So that the fact that we got out into 40 countries means there's an interest for our designs. And that, but they are the least sellable products of what we started with. Only now, with these two bottom products, the Kegel balls and the first, our first vibrator, are we entering high volume. So it's a little early to tell. Uh, and, uh, but you, you still, put it this way, a good sales uh, for a vibrator you should sell maybe 20, 20,000 a year of them, then, you're, then you have a, a good seller in the high-end market to give you a, an idea. Uh, when it comes to like a stone product or steel products, more exclusive products, even if you sell a thousand a year, it's very good because that's where we're at in this industry. It can't be compared to the other consumer. Uh, yeah, so this is the stone, which actually sells it's quite a lot. This <laughs> is the one that's increasing the most, uh, <laughs> in fact. And yeah, the vibrator was the first vibrator. They kept, it came out in uh, December. December. We didn't hit. Uh, we missed the, the Christmas sale. The whole sales. So yeah. it's this year. We'll see how it goes. But it's it's won a prize for the best the female product of 2014. So it's looking good. What kind of stone is this? This is larvikite. It's uh, Norway's national rock. <laughs> and uh, so what, it's what leftovers. It's, actually, it's really <laughs> leftover rock because. It's used for decorative slabs and facades and kitchen counters. And they are sold by like three times three <laughs> meters uh, in slabs. And if there's a crack anywhere there, then they dump the whole thing. In fact, the rock industry, 90% is dumped. So there's a lot of good material that just goes to waste. Mm. So for smaller items to carve and make things, then you, it's basically free. And you saw the clitoris uh, picture of... Uh so, so you can explain that, <laughs> how it works, actually. Well, yeah, but going back, the, the idea that the clitoris, when it's erect, surrounds the vagina means that, you know, you can talk about G-spots or whatever, but the idea is that even then, just to talk a little bit about the details, it looks very classic when you see it like this. This is designed to both stimulate the G-spot, but also entering, just by twisting a little, you can hit all of that. Uh, all, that, all of those sensitive spots that will be there once the clitoris is erect. You don't need vibration for it, you need pressure. And then ergonomic design, so you're not working yourself to death while doing it. <laughs> so you come and look at this later, you can actually just put it in your hand, you can feel how it would vary the contact points inside. And it gives you an idea, and that's part of what we also have to do. We have to fight an industry where everything vibrates. That's the solution. If it vibrates, it's good. And that's actually just a compensation for sometimes very bad design. Mm -hmm. uh, so to, to really study uh, and, and, and know your product, uh, it's, uh, there's a whole school to go. Uh, so there's a lot for people, consumers, to learn. In a good shop, they'll teach you. And this is the pin string I mentioned before that uh, stimulates the prostate from the outside. So it goes like this. <laughs> it never works. <laughs> I keep on trying. Uh, but yes, it comes in two sizes. 
uh, and you have all the equipment goes through and then this comes up behind the testicles and, and massages all the erectile tissue there and pushes gently up under the prostate. So for someone who's not quite ready for the back entrance, then this can be a, an alternative. Well, then we talk about the prolapse anyway. Yeah, <laughs> we can talk more about them. Uh, did the other two find their drawings? We had three, yes? And... Ah! <laughs> and these are the extra... <laughs> And send them to, uh, and then if you own up to them, you'll also have a have a product you can get. Everybody needs. You can come and get it afterwards. But you also mentioned that you test it before, but do you do you do it yourself or do yeah. you have? Yeah, that's the normal work day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every morning, <laughs> it's, it's hard work. <laughs> well, uh, yes, uh, I, I, that's the intern job. <laughs> I mean, we we uh, we do test ourselves because you know it, test it, ourselves. It, we do t test them ourselves, uh, of course, because if it if neither of us like it, then you know how can we work with it? Uh, but it can't just be something we like. So, but it's better to to let people who, are, who know toys and have tried other things, so you, you'd rather have a little group of 10 people who can try. And if 10 different men or 10 different women, if eight out of them really love it, then that's, that's more than good enough. We don't have to have 100 people test it because we're so different already that you don't need too many to, 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 to cover quite a lot of areas. So, uh, but yes, we have to, as far as we can. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes you do wish you had a penis for a day just to figure out <laughs> that side of it too. But we, there we just have to rely on. The good thing about the penis and testicles are they're on the outside. So for certain things, it's, you can do the right measurements and figure out how to fit it. But at the end of the day, you need a guy's version of how it was to use. Uh, and so you have to have some very trusted people who really can give you good feedback. And there are, there's not a, it's not a problem. Is it quite difficult to get into this industry as women? Like, is it kind of gender-sided? I think the industry as a whole, yes. It's very male-dominated, uh, male-owned, and also because uh, in its day, the porn industry had a, a lot of, is where that drove the sex toys. So it was that kind of product. And uh, in our side, the more high-end, there are a lot more women who work in the industry not so many on the manufacturing side, though. I mean, where Lynn is probably one of a handful of female designers around the world working full time with this. So that makes us unique, but, uh, but it's not hard because the ones who work with what we do are very, I would, it's, it's uh, the high, I call it high end, and what, with that I mean quality products. Uh, they don't have to be expensive or expensive materials, but kind of idealistic people working behind it. And they tend to be, you don't really care about gender. You just care about a good product and, and getting the product out to, you know, get it, getting rid of all those shitty products, put it that way. So we work tightly together with our competitors because together we're, we need to, anyone's success is everybody's success. So in that way, it's, it's, uh, it's super friendly and very fun. And you get good tips, you can check out things, you have each other's back. Yeah, so it's very, yeah, it is, it really is. Uh, yeah. Are we done then? <laughs> 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 You're right, no?